So we're going to get started. Thank you, community members, for coming. Thank you, Ruben. Can you hear up? No, it's weird. Oh, that's the cat. I need some help with. I'm doing good. Yeah. That's a trick. Yeah, you're good. Where are the slides? Hey, Mark. Are the slides? <laughs> yeah, we're, just... we're ready. We're ready. Thank okay. you. Welcome, everybody. We're having a community forum tonight. And as soon as the slides get up, I'll have a little blur. I guess I can start. Yeah, OK. We'll let the projector warm up in the meantime. Uh, this forum is about sharing some information about how, we budget, how the budget process works and about gathering some early information to inform the remaining process. Can you hear me OK? I see some. I don't know what's going on. Oh, Jenny. Welcome. We get so excited when we get public, and I'm sorry that I've been bugging some of you, but it's, yeah, thank you for being here. Maybe they should. Oh, there it is. Come yeah. on. We call it building a vision before building a budget because our goal is to help our board and our community ground the budget and our financial discussion in what we actually are doing for the kids and what is best for kids. It, the purpose overall of the meeting is to have a meaningful conversation with the public, it, in this case, you guys, and, and we want to center all the conversation around students and what are the beliefs and the dreams and aspirations mm -hmm. of our community members. So trying to stay up here in the fire tower, not doing the work. And uh, now I'm going to pass it to Megan. It worked a second ago, Mark. Now it's not. not. Next. There we go. Yeah. But I don't know if you did that or I did that. Um, oh, so uh, I also just wanted to say <laughs> we're missing our student reps and also our high school folks because right now U32 and Montpelier boys soccer are in the semifinals. I think the score was tied 1-1 when we walked over. Um, so we will excuse them for tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we would. We've talked about this before. If you've attended a community forum, we do um, a land acknowledgement for a lot of reasons. Um, and these land acknowledgements that we use have been written by students, um, which is why our student board reps were going to read them. Um, so I'm going to read this on behalf of uh, Avery, Dewey, and Andrew. These are a few years old. Um, we will cycle through uh, different student versions of our land acknowledgements. Um, so just want to be clear, these are our students' voices. Um, so we want to acknowledge that U32, I know we're in Berlin, but these are written by, uh, by our students at U32, sits on the unceded traditional lands of the Abenaki Nation, a tribe of the Wabanaki Confederacy that includes the Kosek Abenaki of the Indakina, meaning homeland, territory of Vermont. We ask you to join us and other organizations in acknowledging the Abenaki community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We also acknowledge that many organizations in the United States have perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples from our collective history. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism here in Vermont, the place the Abenaki Nation calls the Dawnland. As you can tell, we don't get to practice before we do this uh, presentations, but we're gonna do try to do our best. So uh, the budget, uh, the budget development timeline. Uh, hopefully, you can see it clearly there. Uh, we kicked off the year 2023-2024 budget development process with a board training to explain how uh, the budget is developed and how the Vermont uh, education funding system works. Uh, we agreed in some assumptions at our last meeting, uh, and those were uh, what we were going to, the assumptions for dental, HR, community connections, and food services expenses to be calculated for the year 23-24. And that's going to be our budget draft number one. Uh, if you're interested in viewing that training, please uh, go to our website, and you can find the, right, right in the website district. There's a little link. 
The focus of tonight's community forum will be to review the district's current priorities for our students and to gather input about what aspects of the district are most meaningful to our community and hear from the public what they believe the board should not exactly support, but what is important to you. It, the board will review the level service draft on November 16. So this is it work previous to that to that meeting. And the goal of the presentation is to understand the estimated costs. I feel like I'm talking right now to people that know about this, but there might be some people in. Uh, do we have enough people online? What? Okay. Yeah. So in draft one, we'll incorporate the, and the estimated increase for salaries, benefits, insurance, transportation, anticipated special ed needs. After reviewing the budget draft number one, the board will provide the leadership team with additional parameters and priorities, including budget draft number two. Yeah. The board will host additional community forums and presentations of the budget draft one and two on December 21st and January 18th. The community is, encour is encouraged to attend and to provide input and ask questions. Uh, the goal of the board is to approve the final draft uh, on January 18th, as you can see there, in order to warn and, and prepare for our annual meeting. The one thing I was going to say is that the November 16 meeting, so where we were presenting the draft number one, is going to be virtual. So that would be an easy meeting for hopefully you can let your friends know so that they can attend. Uh, a public hearing will take place on March 6th. Uh, to provide information uh, on the articles to be voted by Australian ballot on March 7, 2022. Thanks, Flora. So I'm just going to share a little bit about how we organized um, the presentation tonight. The goal, again, is to get input from folks that are here. We do have a couple of ways to get input from folks who aren't able to be here. Um, but you're going to hear from most of the leadership team tonight. and. Um, the, the way we've organized it is to start with, um, we're entering budget season, so we're gonna talk about resources and what we should be doing and supporting with our resources. Um, and so we start with the why. why. What do we need to accomplish with the resources that our communities provide us? Um, and so we're gonna talk about our mission, we're gonna talk about our priority work areas for the district, um, and some information about our instructional plans. We'll talk about our students, We'll give a little bit of information about what we know about our students and how that impacts our resources. Um, we will talk about things like enrollment. We'll talk about um, some data sources, talk about some direction the board has given us around the budget. Um, it will not have a lot of detail in some of these areas. It's enough detail to frame a conversation about um, what you think it's important for the board to know. Um, we will talk about the timeline, which we just did a little bit, um, and the different ways that the community can get input, um, and hopefully we will have a small group activity and we'll sort of organize that based on who's here and who's on the screen at that point. All right, so I think I'm turning it to Aaron. Yeah. Aaron, do you want to remind them that there's some goodies there too? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't hand that to you very long. Well. Okay. I stayed over here. Good evening. Welcome to Berlin Elementary School. <laughs> Hope you have a pleasant stay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first, uh, we're going to take some time to remember our why. We're going to give you some information tonight about the work we do in each school, in our schools, what we want students to learn, our curriculum, our mission, goals and plans that are part of required state work to achieve the desired student outcomes. In our mission, we want to underscore that the budget process should be grounded in our mission. The budget is a narrative that, when done well, should reflect our students' needs and our community values. <clears throat> Budgeting is actually a year-round process that helps us actualize our mission and our values. So we'll take a look at some of the various plans that the district has developed in the last several years to identify areas of focus expected outcomes. And I was told to mention that there's food. <laughs> yeah, <I think. laughs> Who's next? I think this one will be done. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So we ground ourselves in our mission. We operationalize our mission through our student learning outcomes. And you can see that our student learning outcomes are there. 
we um, have specified the areas in which the knowledge and the skills that we think our students need to know and be able to do in order to realize that mission. They are the foundation of all of the work that we do related to curriculum, instruction, and assessment. And um, you can dig deeper and find out how they're operationalized at each grade level through performance indicators and standards. And they were approved by this board in 2016. So as Jen just mentioned, um, around our student learning outcomes, our, in addition to delivering the curriculum that we have determined is important for our graduates, we are situated in a state that it requires that we develop plans for continuous improvement. Last spring, excuse me, the board approved a plan that was focused on academic achievement and safe and healthy schools with two really important lenses to guide our work, excuse me, to guide our work. Um, those lenses are student engagement and our work on humanity and justice. While this coming budget, you won't see that there are changes regarding the continuous improvement plan. It's important for us to keep in mind that there are implications for budgeting long term, as some of the resources noted in our current plan is supported through the use of our ESSER funds. I stood in for Steven because he's cheering on our teams at the game. Um, next slide, Mark. Great. The other, in addition, as you know, to the continuous improvement plan, we also were required to write a, a recovery plan to emerge even stronger from the pandemic and to address um, the issues that were caused by the pandemic. We in Washington Central chose to um, name our plan our plan for moving forward and not our recovery plan. And now this plan is really financially operationalized through our ARP ESSER funds. So the three major pillars were the social emotional learning, mental health and well-being pillar, an engagement and truancy pillar, and academic achievement and success. And as um, many of you know, we are required to publish our public plan for the spending of our ESSER funds, and we are required to gather stakeholder um, feedback on a regular basis. So we maintain a place on our website in order to get that information from folks on a regular basis, and we ensure that we have opportunities to more formally engage stakeholders every six months. We integrated the ideas involved in those plans into three areas. Um, District-wide areas of focus came out of the continuous improvement planning this past spring. So academic achievement, we will reduce the difference in math performance between historically marginalized students and historically privileged students. First instruction, systems of intervention, uh, safe and healthy schools, we will increase students' access to classroom instruction um, through restorative practices and social-emotional learning, humanity and justice, um, the equity book study, and the humanity and justice coalition. In addition to the areas of focus that Caroline provided, the board provided this parameter in May. Um, the leadership team was grateful for that for two reasons. One, it indicates year-round budgeting, which we appreciate, and then also solidifies our, underground, our um, solid commitment to community justice and equity. And this parameter encourages us to move forward in achieving significant improvement in math and literacy for our historically marginalized and underserved students, as well as our students receiving free and reduced lunch. I'm gonna jump in on this one. Speaking for Alicia. Um, so this next section, we're gonna talk, talk a little bit about how we focus on students as we build the budget over the course of the year. Um, when we think about how we need to spend and direct our resources, and that includes both financial resources, but also time in our student day, um, we do that based on information about students. Um, today, tonight, is not an in-depth data presentation, but we wanted to share a little bit about the different types of data 
that we use as a system to understand how we're doing about all that work. Um, we look at benchmark assessments. I'm not gonna read this slide. You have access to it, um, but I'll kind of highlight. Uh, a benchmark assessment is where uh, research would suggest a student should be and where our students are relative to that. Um, diagnostic helps us kind of dig in and figure out exactly what a student is good at, what they're, what's difficult for them, and helps us target instruction. Formative data is information that we get in real time so that we can react immediately to where kids are and how to adjust our instruction. Um, screening is how we flag students and say, oh, this student isn't where we want them to be in, a, in one of those areas, and that allows us to um, intervene and implement some of our interventions. And summative is really at the end of either a unit or a year, um, and it measures learning over time. There's examples of each one of those things here, um, and there's uh, lots of opportunities over the course of a year um, where the board can receive some of this data. But for tonight's purposes, we really just want you to understand that this is all part of the picture that we paint so that we know how we should uh, be building our budget. So this slide illustrates the decrease in total student, student enrollment from 1,594 in FY18 to 1,436 in FY23, or 9.91% decrease. As the board will recall from the training at the last meeting, our enrollment impacts the calculation of our per pupil spending and therefore tax rates. Vermont's education funding formula is based upon cost per student, so a decrease in enrollment negatively impacts the tax rate before any changes are made to the budget. Later in the budget building process, the board will see some additional information about enrollment and class sizes. This is meant to provide an overview of our more global realities. Okay, so this slide is just a review of some of our financials, the general budget of $39,169,267 was approved by the taxpayers for this current fiscal year. And as you can see, you sorry can about see. the slide. Right, yeah, really it's really it's not a good I guess I will read the slide too. Um, <laughs> the large pieces of the pie are direct instruction regular ed, which is in dark blue, which is 34.39% of the budget. Direct instruction special ed in green is 20.94% of the budget. And support services, guidance, nurse, library, tech, integration, and curriculum are 11.32%. Administration, excuse me, 10.35%. And operation of plant, 8.68%. Next slide. Uh, this diagram illustrates the various funding sources that offset the general fund expense budget. The two sources that make up the most of the revenues with 80.41% coming from education spending and 13.14% coming from special ed expenditures and reimbursements. So the leadership team has already identified current realities that will impact the budget, including rising costs, declining enrollment, staffing shortages, and changes to the way that Vermont funds special education needs and changes to the weighting of pupils for the equalized pupil calculation. Based upon board recommendation made last year, the plan is to discontinue the use of fund balance as a revenue to support the equity scholar and residents and the new teacher added at East Montpelier Elementary School. We are looking ahead to assess the impact of reductions in grant funding, including the sunset of our ESSER funding in FY25, which has supported additional staff for nursing, school counselors, and interventionists throughout the pandemic. And we are also focused on instructional time because it's a finite resource. Thank you, Suzanne. <coughs> so 
our next, uh, our goal is to break up into small groups. Um, in a second, I'm going to flip the slide to show you the um, questions that we were going to ask uh, because ideally, so this is designed to gather in small groups. We've got plenty of space in this room. Um, we would pass out a mechanism to take notes and kind of distribute board and administrators. Um, but I'd like to talk about how we could do that differently because we have, um, Mark, how many people do we have on the screen? Uh, just one yeah. citizen and one president. Okay. Um, and uh, a, a few community members here, which we're really excited about. Um, these are the questions that we are going to that we would like to get reaction from folks. And to be clear, board members are community members. So we, we, we do want to do this. We also want to make it a reasonably comfortable experience for those of you who maybe don't want to be in a group with several group member, uh, board members. So, Florida, if you have a thought. Yeah, sir. I, I think if it's okay, let's stay together, or you guys rather have groups. I, I want to put it in our community members, and on because it's going to be hard to. We don't originally we thought we could have an online group, and an in person group, but we had too little attendance, and you know we have, from what I can see, three community members, and board members. So I. I'm not going to be the dictator either. So, what is the pleasure of the board? Should we stay as one, or should we divide in two? Well, let's bid on the community members first yes. and see, uh, you know, the right. fundraiser. <laughs> You're a board member emeritus. Yeah, it's right. It's, it is a little. I would just say it is a little easier to have a meaningful conversation if we break up. Otherwise, it will be sort of like going around, and so yeah. that's my sense. Yeah. Is just from a activity design, it might be easier to break up unless folks are really opposed. To that. I think no, from an information good. gathering point of view, I would like to hear from the three yeah, that's what community members, two of which are recent board members. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I would like to hear from them. I kind of know what these people think. <laughs> sure. The feedback we got last year. Separated. Small groups was that they were just too small, and there weren't. It didn't allow for meaningful conversation. And so I don't know. I'll defer to you. So yeah, that's sort of what I it, I really insisted in small groups last year, and the info that we got back was like, you know, we from board members especially was that they wanted to hear all of the feedback mm -hmm. from everybody. So if the Community members are brave enough, which I know they are, <laughs> to stay in a huge group and feel comfortable. And I also think you guys are comfortable enough with us to speak your mind. We would stay in one in one big group so that yeah, everybody yeah. has the benefit of listening to this. And, and like we said, we're like Maya was saying, it, let's just start with question number one. And if you guys feel comfortable starting up the conversation will bring there's a mic up here and I'm hearing something in Zoom that my yeah what one more person just joined. Okay. Can they use me? Oh it was your double appearance. <laughs> here twice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah and I might try to log into the Zoom so I can see the person that is on Zoom. But so what do you value most about the school experience? of the children in our community. Do I pass the mic? Should we? Or can you hold it for yeah. Mark? Oh, yeah, Mark I'll hold it. Yeah. And, but there's one mic up there. Is that for community members? That's for, for the orca. 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 Oh, sorry. Orca. I am taking notes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And Lisa, you're taking notes, too. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Becca, and I live in Middlesex. So it's nice to see many of you in person. Um, I have a, a second grader and a kindergartner at Romney. And I value most the, the people, right, the teachers, um, the people who teach the specials, the classroom teachers, the people who do special education and intervention um, with my children. So a lot of my 
um, focus and thinking about how to do a, a budget that makes sense for our community is really, resin, is really sort of rooted in that. And what can we do to make sure that our staff and faculty are getting what they need and that they want to stay in our district and things like that. So. Um, I'm Ruben Bennett. I'm a parent of a current sixth grader and 17th year as an East Montpelier parent, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> so the thing that I that I value the most is the sense of community that springs from the school, and that is rooted in the teachers. It's rooted in the faculty. It's rooted in um, it's rooted in the educational experience that happens in the school. Um, the values that the school district has codified and that the school district has put into practice through all of the educational programs there um, are, they're very clearly represented. I think, and I obviously have a lot more experience with East Montpelier, but I think they're very clearly um, telegraphed out through all of the schools in the district. Uh, and, and that work is incredibly important. I know that I have made lifelong friends through the school district by parents and kids in common and, and all of that. Uh, and I think it's easy as a school board to forget that, uh, that, that that's one of the real, like, we're always talking about community engagement, but whether it's super visible to the board or not, it, it's happening, it's there. Um, and so at the end of the day, we're here to, this school district has a very clear job, which is to, uh, to prepare students to move on into the real world, however that is at the end of the program. Um, and, and that has a million facets that we don't have to talk about tonight. <laughs> but, uh, but I think all in all, that's, that's the work of the school, and that's what's been valuable to me. I'm Chani Waterhouse, I'm from Worcester. And I wrote down three things, and the first one was community connectedness as well. Um, uh, especially at the elementary school level, uh, the way the kids are so connected, and the faculty and staff, and I think at the elementary school level, the scale allows for connectedness among the parents as well, which is, I think, really beneficial for the kids, and I would love to see more of that. A lot of it happens by accident. I think it is it just really strengthens kids when parents are also in relationship with each other. Um, the second thing on my list was joy, which is just, I my experience is that my kids have loved school. And I know that's not true for every kid, um, but, it's powerful and there should be more of it and as much as possible. And then my experience with the educational quality for, for my own kids has been consistently high and I really value that. And again, I know that um, there are families that don't uh, feel that that's true for their kids and that I think is really important that everyone would be able to feel like the educational quality that their kids are receiving is consistently high. Mm. Yeah, uh, Mark, I didn't, could you ask the person on the screen, I didn't join the Zoom, because I, the person on the screen, because uh, I can't see who it is, oh. and I'll, I'll join the Zoom now. Sorry, I meant to do that. I think the, it, the question is just, yeah. Oh, there, yeah. Oh, so it's, it's, David. it's David. It's David. It's David. Do you have David. anything to share? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and we don't have to put him on the spot. Yeah, too if long, he doesn't, <laughs> I don't know that he can hear us. Mark, where's the mic for the, no, for, for the, the, for the Zoom. computer? Is for it? What? Computer. The Zoom. Like, 
Oh, it's the album. It's, it's this one. one okay, perfect. Oh, okay, so we can assume that he can hear us. Okay, great. So, okay, so then we can go into the next, uh, the next question. Into the next question. <laughs> Yeah. Question or no? <laughs> it, yeah, there's no reason yes. to not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to echo some of what was said, which is community is huge, and I particularly appreciate how in our district we nurture not just the academic um, side, but the emotional side of our students. So, you know, whether it's the principal meeting every student at the door every morning and dog. Um, or you know the yoga club that just started at Dodi, but you know it's just a really holistic um, community to be a part of, which I appreciate, and that continues into high school, where you know yes, the academics are important, but so is theater and sports and art, and it's all celebrated um, together. So thank you. So, Tony, I have a follow-up question for you, um, and it, um, I, I'm assuming the answer will be an anecdotal in a way, but you talked about how um, you valued the quality of the education that your students were getting, um, but that in conversation with other parents, they didn't feel that they were, their students were getting as um, much of a quality education. Was there any sense as to why the difference if it dealt with students in the same school? Well, actually, not, not well. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking about all the people who aren't here, so I'm, and what it took for me to be here, and all the people who couldn't be here tonight, mm -hmm. and I just, um, I just had a conversation a couple nights ago, a lengthy conversation with one of my neighbors who was talking about her kids' experience. And so I was just thinking about her and how different her experience was from mine. And she and I went to elementary school together, we like grew up together, and we've like lived very different lives. And our experience of, of our kids' educations have been really different. So I just was, I feel like I, you know, thinking about her and all the other folks who aren't here, but who are like deeply rooted in the community and we're all connected and we're like, going to the same schools and having totally different experiences in those schools. Okay. So, okay. I, I, my concern was that there was a quality difference for that student in the same school. Right. You know, so, and, and trying Right, to like her kids and my kids' at experience of high school at the same time were just really different. So yeah. that's okay. real. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to move to the next uh, question, and then we can have follow-up questions if there's other things you guys would like to share. So developing the budget usually requires the school board to make choices. So given what you heard tonight, uh, what, do you, oops, I moved my, what do you think the board should consider as they develop the budget? Was there anything concerning that you heard or? Yeah. Sorry, Mike. You're going to get the miles today. Yeah, I need them. I don't see them. I'm wondering how um, the, so the slide with the student enrollment stood out to me because obviously there's we're sliding. Uh, um, does this board have a sense of what that trend looks like? Looking into a crystal ball as best you can. Um, is this, you know, we we see like, you know, population ebb and flow in our communities. Are we projecting this to keep going down? By what degree? Um, I, I mean, I, I assume that you guys have sort of done this work to, to extrapolate that out. But uh, but that was a piece that stood out to me. Suzanne, yeah, Suzanne, do you want to give it to Suzanne right next to you? Because the short answer is, is projections, projections will continue to decline, for sure. 
Suzanne may have some more detail around that, but. I don't have it in front of me, but I would say the answer is that it is a downward trajectory into the future. Um, last year, I think the decrease was 4.5%. This year, it's 9%. It continues to go down in each of our schools. Even East Montpelier this year has seen a, a sizable decrease. And the, the classes coming up are even smaller than the ones that are moving up to the high school. Any other concern, you know, from community members, anything that stood out besides the enrollment? That I think we got enough input about, you know, taking care of, if I'm listening to you guys. Yeah, there. Okay. Um, I also, I think there's sort of a follow-up for me about the enrollment question is, what sort of, you can't ask families to pay a higher and higher country to support but a lot of those things are fixed costs for the district. So I guess I'm curious about what sort of modeling or projections are thinking the board is doing. It sounds like a pretty challenging problem. We're all really smart folks. I mean, we can't be the only district thinking about this. So I guess I'm wondering sort of what are, what are some of the long range planning. I may have missed this at the beginning. I apologize for being late. But what are we thinking about around that so that we, some of those fixed costs we, we can't get around that? And I I think to be fair, as a, as a board, we haven't really said what would we do if the, we, we, we are listening to all of the different aspects that go into the budget and uh, declining population is one. And, you know, we or at least I, we try to emphasize it in our letter, in the report letter that went out last year, right? Like this year, we're going to have to be more creative. Are we, can you guys hear me okay? It's like weird. <laughs> so are we, are we, we keep asking this question, are we structured the way that we need to be structured to best serve our kids and to give the best opportunities and the best outcomes to, and to all our fire kids, right? So we're going to have to, you know, give that question to the leadership team too, right? But how can we structure ourselves to make sure that we're not going to have to let go of of, of teachers, right? But that we know that we don't have enough teachers as it is right now. But our restructure, and, and I know that that is a conversation that we can't have without the community. So it might be that, you know, thinking out loud and with fear of being misinterpreted, but, you know, it, can we be more creative about one of our schools or two of our schools? You know, how do we move kids between our schools or how do we do our uh, policy for, uh, Choice, school choice, right? So how do we make sure that we provide and, you know, a, a crazy idea that we floated last year and it never came to fruition was like, you know, we know that we have a child care problem right now. Should we be more creative in our schools? I think there's a lot of things that we could, that we could do. What we want to make sure is that we're taking 
input from our communities before we dive into any you know, bigger position. Yeah, and I would add to that that this board has two goals that are related to these bigger picture conversations. One of them is long-term planning and one of them is community engagement. And in order for us to have conversations that are difficult, creative, all of the above, we have to really deeply lean into engaging the communities in a visioning. What do we want for our kids? What do we want for them at every step of the way? What's important to us? Um, and then let the conversations about structure follow a conversation about what we believe about our kids. And that really is the board's conversation to have. And that one, to the extent that we can, that should come first. Um, it's hard. Our realities hopefully don't catch up with us faster than then we can have that conversation. But I think that's how the board, that, that, that would be the order of operations because that's how we can make sure that that's what's grounding any decision that gets made around um, our realities. Because our enrollment is a reality. Um, our changes in funding, those are realities. Those are things we're gonna have to face and if we wanna face them in a way that still gets our kids what we want them to have, still gives our communities what they value about our schools, then we really have to lean in on those conversations. And those are not going to um, be magically wrapped up by our uh, round two budget draft, right? Those are long-term conversations. Today's really about, you know, it's thinking about this coming budget season and understanding where we are in that longer, longer trajectory. I don't know if other board members have stuff to share too. The other thing I wanted to add that I believe Aaron mentioned briefly was like we're really moving into year-round budgeting, right? That's a goal of, of the board. And, and if we go back some slides, uh, Mark, uh, I think to me the big takeaway for us is how we're structuring even the reports from our staff now and keeping in mind academic achievement, safe and healthy schools, and humanity and justice. So we're really having that big umbrella of an equity lens when we're looking at all of this so that when we go talk to the community, and like Megan said, it, we can't do it fast enough, right? That's, that is the challenge that, that we have right now. But not everything is going to happen this year, but we need to be creative. No. So, <laughs> well, we, yeah. So, well, this, Obviously, a sound that. system should be in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we have an owl now. <laughs> we do. Yeah. Here I can wrap yeah, it up. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that board forums, and we've heard this from our community, um, are not the only way to get input. So um, we really, really appreciate those who can come, but we also understand that not everyone has. We've had pretty good luck with um, folks saying we like surveys, we like to respond to that way, and we get a reasonable response rate. Don't pretend that it's all the engagement we need to do, but we do have an opportunity. This will go out on our various social media platforms asking the same questions, um, and that's information that the board and the administration can have as they bring the next budget. So, so you'll, you'll get those surveys. Um, we also post the slides themselves so people can kind of have some context. Um, and the next step budget is showing you what, you what would it look like, what would it cost to deliver what we are delivering right now next year. That's what November 16th is. Um, and that's a data point. That's part of our context that then launches us into, so what does that mean for the budget that we're actually going to propose? So I think yeah, that I, I think concludes the community forum portion. Yeah, we have a little bit of board business after. Don't feel like you guys have to stay. We really appreciate the community members in Will David. Thank you for coming. And thank you, you guys, for being here. We really appreciate it. And if you think about something later, we just posted in the Zoom the, the, um, the survey, too. Yes. Or look for Megan's letter, please. Oh. Yeah. Mike's really good at thank you, Mark, today. For <laughs> running the mic. It's getting loose again, I think. From Um, and I may have, again, I apologize for having been late, and I may have missed this, but the November 16th, that's the sort of same as this past year in terms of um, 
is it safe to assume that there isn't going to be a budget that's like, we're going to add a bunch of things to help us meet these additional, those three goals. Is it safe to assume that from November 16th, we're going to have to make cuts, or is that? Well, the, I'm going to try to just be loud. The board will, will, the board will absorb that information and have a discussion about all of that. And they will say, because their job is to thread a needle of what they think the community can support and help us achieve our goals. So they will hear, they will um, learn more about our student, uh, more detail about things like that. Here's what it would cost to do what we're doing now. And then they will give administration some direction. And the direction is dependent on what that first draft looks like, but it also then says, well, we, these are the things really important. So um, it's not always about cuts, but it, it may be about directing resources differently. Okay, that's really helpful, thanks. So I guess a, a follow-up question to that is, if there are certain sort of like, um, what do they call them in uh, federal government, it's like, uh, earmarks or pet projects or whatever, right? So if, say, a community member of me has, like, a, a, I'm really young ho, I want the board desperately to have a comms, a, a, like a 0.5 FTE comms person whose job it is to send out an um, a email to all the front porch forums and everybody in the community, maybe it's 2.25 comms person, I don't know what it is, but someone whose job it is so that all the overworked board members and all the overworked admin folks don't have to take this on, but, like, it's a dream, dream I have, I'm not gonna let it go. I'm gonna come to every community for to make it. Just sort of kidding, but not. But um, so, <laughs> so like there might be, where is the chance yes. for community members to sort of, is it in the survey, should we all take the survey and write those notes in yes. there? Okay. Yep, it, that's not the only opportunity, but that's the best opportunity for to front load the feedback so that we sort of get it, so that the board can hear it out of the gate. Um, and then there's more opportunities each time something's presented, but um, yes. We take notes, and the survey's great. Okay. Could, could you say a little more about what you're looking for? Well, I think it's, a, it's not a full-time, I mean, maybe, but there's probably plenty of work for it to be a full-time position, but I'm conscious of, of these constraints fiscally. But, so I think it's a person whose job it is to um, have a, a paragraph that is ready to go for each front, local front porch forum about what the meeting is, what's on the agenda, what's gonna be discussed, and then a, a follow-up, right? After the meeting, here's the, two paragraph summary of what happened, they're the person who's gonna, because um, I, just the reality is, all of you are working so hard to expect you to be able to do that on a regular basis. I mean, I've been tasked with that when I'm a volunteer, and like, I do it the first two months, I'm so into it, I get it out there, and then, you know, right, so like, if it's someone's job to do that, and other stuff, you know, maybe they can facilitate, um, other opportunities for community contact, um, but really almost, yeah, because like a comms person, they're the person who posts on social media, who maintains a Facebook or Twitter or whatever sort of other pathways for the board to liaise with community members on a more regular back and forth basis. <laughs> uh, one just quick follow-up question. One of the priorities was uh, was around equity and marginalized or not marginalized. Is that achievement gap um, improving or not improving in the last, say, three years? That's a great question. I, I mean, the easy answer to that question, and this goes for schools everywhere, is that the pandemic exacerbated our gaps, for sure. Um, Right, so there's enough of an outlier that it's almost not really a fair question right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you've nailed well, the, and, like, and the core work. Well, yeah. that come into sharper focus, yes. Yes. actually. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to say one last thing, and then this is like the most attention I've ever gotten from the board. Like, <laughs> I'm so lucky. Um, I, I, first, I just wanted to say thank you, a huge thank you for to all of you for your leadership and your labor, and especially to Floor and Megan. And um, I told this to Jen, but I was just composing love letters to Jen in my head all of last year. I didn't actually write any of them, but I feel like she was getting them through the interview. But, um, 
so thank you. But I, in relation to what you were talking about, I was thinking about the community at large and how bizarre it is that there are people in the community who are like, well, I'm not connected to the school because I don't have a kid there. Versus like, these are our future adults. Yeah. Like, these are the adults of, you know, 10 years and 15 and 20 years from now. I, kind of, I love the idea of a communication strategy that's just like, like people, this is not about like your kids are already grown up. Like these are our, this is our future. And we're all in it. Thank you. Thank you. If we have a mic problem, just kind of wiggle the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You need voice lessons. Don't apologize. We're still rusty at what this now looks like again when we go back to rotating. So we appreciate everyone's patience because it's been it's been three years since we've remembered how to set eat up each space. So thank you. This is our first try at Berlin, and we're so excited to be here. So thank you again for coming. We're going to move into the board meeting, and thank you for your input. You're not going to stay? <laughs> you should go enjoy what is left of the day, guys. Run. I just want to sit. I thought I grabbed it. I moved it. She loves it. There's a If anybody needs a copy of the agenda, we have them here. So we're going to move into our board learning. Was she hoping to do In terms of welcome sale. Where would that be? She wants to do research. I actually get to keep the mag to you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, don't, I don't think you need a big introduction. I got Everybody run. read. My daughter's going back to oh, New yeah. York tomorrow. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> she knows I don't. That doesn't kind of run away. Yeah. Yes. See you later. See you later. But, um, so she might go. Oh. I'm like, sorry, what? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. call to order. I forgot. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. We, yeah, we should call it to order. Okay, so we're adjourning the community forum. We're going to call the meeting to order at 7 11, even though we posted it at 7 20. But it's our learning, so I think we're okay. Is that okay with everybody? And yeah. I, actually, let's give five minutes to use the restroom. Hey, thank that you for being here. Uh, oh, these. Really eager to dig into parts of chapter four. I don't, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of those that read it thoroughly, uh, but we'll know quickly if you have some questions, thoughts, comments about the content. Uh, this particular research, I, I became close friends with Ivan Lawrenson from Montana. He was a school board member in uh, Missoula for 20 years, and they have kind of in Montana, what was historically maybe more common here in Vermont, but still is the case where uh, there were K-6 districts, K-8 districts, 9-12 districts, K-12 districts, pre-K-12 districts, all of that. But Ivan served as a board member for 20 years and was also an honors college teacher and college administrator. And he decided pretty late in life to finish a doctorate in education. Uh, so Bill McCaw, who co-authored this chapter, was one of his professors, and through the process they became very close friends. Uh, but my opportunities with Ivan included a couple of really key moments. Uh, he had heard that Mary Della Gardell was doing some workshops for me in Washington State with small groups, and what we were doing was sort of fishbowl. So uh, for, for train the trainer, work, Mary was coming in from Iowa, working with the board superintendent team, and those of us were on the outside, watching and observing and then debriefing later with Mary. You'll remember Mary Delagardell's name from chapter one, and she passed away about six years ago, so right about the same time this book came out. And, and I would, I've, I've often said that, you know, the, the book is worth chapter one, just knowing Mary Delagardell, uh, who I think of people like Caroline, who have been a school board member and a school administrator and really have sort of a unique perspective uh, because 
wouldn't it be amazing if Caroline was working on a doctorate in school governance and how she could bring that school board experience <laughs> again? I know she's, I'm going to leave my back to her. Uh, <laughs> you know, bring, bring sort of the two sides together because there, there's just not enough of this work. So Ivan was able to do something similar uh, from his experience in higher ed and then also as a school board member, sort of think across the, the line, if you will, or think across the gray area, the blurry spots between what does a board do versus what does a superintendent do. And, and all, just a lot of the best research on school governance comes from folks who have had a little bit of experience here, a little bit of experience there, and let's think together about this. So great to have administrators with us. I'm just uh, looking this way over uh, tonight because we certainly want them to weigh in, and I really don't mean to have my back to them. It's just the way the floor made me stand. And we've gone since August uh, thinking about and trying to tie some things together. We sent you some notes that highlight things that I'll go a bit off the cuff on here, but really in the introduction to this book, Improving School Board Effectiveness, there's an emphasis on the fact that school boards do matter. Uh, this is, was a novel idea 25 to 30 years ago. Research started to emerge early 80s into the 90s. Maybe boards are sort of a missing component in district improvement. Uh, because most work was done either on the classroom level, in particular the teacher and the student, and then to a limited extent, even with principals, it was probably into the turn of this century that people began to decide that what superintendents do might matter. It was really a, a, a seminal research study in 2005 where folks said, oh, who the superintendent is might affect student achievement in some ways. And so in that mix was this idea that what we as school board members do matters. And, and I still say we, even though it's been quite a few years since I served on a local board, uh, I, I think of myself as a school board member still. So in chapter one, we get this seminal study from Mary Della Gardell that spanned about 13 to 15 years, depending on the phases you look at, it was well-funded and uh, well thought through. It's still the most cited piece of school governance research uh, for people doing research in governance today. And, and it ended about 2013, so not that long ago. But the, the great news is here, people like Ivan have continued to study and build upon that work. Uh, we sort of skipped over chapter two. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna mention the one really salient point from chapter two tonight. Uh, but chapter three we spoke about last time, or we talked about last time we were together, uh, about community engagement and the board bonding with each other, um, getting to know each other. Ursula just reminded me minutes ago how important that is and how valuable it is. Because when board members have good relationships, strong relationships with each other, it's like um, Stephen M. R. Covey wrote about it, in The Speed of Trust, things happen quicker. They happen more quickly, they happen with less drama, when, when people have strong relationships on the board. They also emphasize the importance of the board having strong relationships with the community, and how that um, research into nonprofit boards and other types of boards have shown this connection that the, the, the more the board is cohesive with each other, and the more they're sort of adhesive or connected to the community, the more likely that the organization is successful and thriving, that idea of bridging and bonding. And so uh, from that, we step into chapter four, again, built on the Lighthouse study. What Ivan did was he took the work that Mary had done around the beliefs and sort of proposed actions. These are, when we look at a, a board in a system that's improving in student achievement, and we compare that to the actions and beliefs of a board that's stagnant or declining in student achievement, Mary sort of teased out with a team of researchers, these are some of the differences. These boards behave one way and these boards seem to behave another. And she began to sort of create a typology or categorize boards that were in districts, in, in districts that were improving in achievement, they had conversations about data some of those key differences between those in the boards that didn't have 
improving achievement. They didn't have a clue what was going on with data in the stagnant districts. And they initially did this research in the state of Georgia. So they compared districts that were similar to demographics and as, as comparable as they could, and then looked at how, how are the students performing on state tests in Georgia. In those systems where um, students were achieving at increasing levels, board members said things like, not, not all of our students come here equally or fully prepared, but we do everything we can to make sure they get what it takes to be successful. Board members in districts that were declining in achievement, they said things like, well, we could do better if parents would send us better kids. Literal statements in uh, interviews with board members. Right? And we could do better with our students if their parents would turn the TV off. There was always this if or this but, this excuse, and really one of the, the takeaways to transition this is, is that idea of a leadership deciding they're not going to let there be an excuse, whether it's you know zip code slash neighborhood, whether it's socioeconomics, whether it's race, whether it's any demographic factor that would pre-suggest a difference in student outcomes, boards and high achieving systems said, we're not going to make excuses here. What we've learned since then, and I think Ivan's work helped us to learn this, that when boards look at student achievement in an improving district or a district that's making progress, not only are they not making excuses for the data, they're not blaming or shaming. So the beauty for me in this work and what's been exciting over the last 20 years, one of the most exciting things for me has been Ivan Lawrenson's research, picking up where Mary left off with here's what we think and then doing a, a quantitative analysis of board self-reported self-assessment data in a research-based and statistically validated board self-assessment. I even used that as the foundation for his dissertation and simply noted these districts where students are improving in achievement, they're doing some things differently than other districts are. And again, uh, we have the qualitative that really came with some quantitative components out of the lighthouse, but this chapter four takes it to the specifics. There's actually seven different things that they mentioned there in uh, the middle of this chapter that they found highly statistically significant with boards having a relationship with improving student achievement. Now, I firmly believe, in, and one of the reasons I'm here tonight, I believe that school boards make a difference. No credible person can say, if boards do one, two, and three, student achievement will improve. There are, there are multiple linkages in between that, from every single factor we can imagine, right, to get to that, that leap. We can't make that leap. What we can say, is that districts that are improving in achievement, they have some characteristics, the board has some characteristics that, that they bring to the equation. Thoughts or questions? I've kind of ignored my questions sitting beside me here on anything I just said. I'm trying to connect the dots, and I want to do that before we close, too, because our emerging research, since this study, again, is showing a strong linkage that I think is really important for your system. They start the chapter, I think, with these thoughts. Is, is this in the best interest of students? I, I've been to school boards where they have on the back of their name placards, student first, or something like that. You're like, you know, it, it becomes kind of a mantra. But why is it typically difficult, according to the authors 
Any thoughts? Why is it typically difficult for a lay elected board to really make that leap between just the rhetoric of the question, is this in the best interest of students, and, and the reality in the way that we govern? Why is that difficult for us? Ursula? So aside from like our professional knowledge that we come with or whatever job that we have, and some of us have educational backgrounds, some of us do not, um, we don't come um, with how to be on the board, how to be on an education-based board too, yeah. right? It's different. And so you don't know. You don't always know about the data to ask yeah, I feel like I'm having that conversation daily with people. Like, what in our life prepared us to be part of an education governance team? Like, and how's that different from our normal day job, if you will? You had a comment? I was basically going to say the same thing. Okay. Just as a citizen board, yeah, we, we don't bring a lot of expertise to the table. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have a lot of very expertise. So think with me, because um, some of the research says people with a background in education, they actually have a bigger struggle than those of us that didn't have a background in education. Uh, think with me about what is the expertise that the board members do bring? Like, what's that critical expertise? And it doesn't you know, need to be a, a, a quick answer or an on-the-spot answer. But what is the expertise that lay elected citizens bring? And, and perhaps in an ideal world and perhaps in the real world as well. Yeah. So I think it's about systems. So if we come together and think about our systems and from the system functioning, I think another barrier that comes into play is what brought me to the table might be very different than what brought others yeah. to the table and whether or not I'm open to figuring that out together or not can be a barrier or can help with that systems work. And that's been identified in the last several years, the systems thinking component, right, of being a good board member. And some people have life experience that allows them to think more in systems than others because, I mean, typically as you look around our community, School districts are frequently the largest business, largest entity, largest employer, biggest budget of anything else in the community. And that's, that's true all across the country. Um, so, so all to say, a lot of us don't necessarily have experience in higher order systems, complex organizations. You know, we might be a sole proprietor or, um, you know, we might even have employees, but it might be six or seven. Not 150 or whatever, right? It's, it's it's more limited. Certainly, an advantage to have systems thinking. What is the expertise that lay elected citizens bring to a school board? I'm looking at Natasha. So he's looking away. I heard the word community. Chris, um, it can be nothing. I'm other than being a community member, ah. and you have the eyes and ears of the community. But in terms of expertise. Maybe nothing. And, and maybe in an you know? ideal world, because I heard community here and I heard community there. Yeah. Somebody else first. Was it Daniel? Somebody had their hand up. Oh, first, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's those connections. You both said community, but it's we all come with a variety of connections and a variety of levels at which we're involved in our community, and we talked about it in the last chapter on that networking. So we do bring in that networking difference and therefore different ways of thinking or even just different knowledge bases that we can share. So I'm going to look at a situation differently than the rest of you. And it doesn't mean we won't be able to like agree on something. It just means we're going to have different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you do have different viewpoints. Kari? Yeah, I'm kind of struggling with expertise. I don't really yeah. think about it that way. but. I think it's more like a willingness to yeah. mm -hmm. step up and say, I'm, I'm willing to govern, I'm willing to um, represent what I believe is the values of the community, what, what we expect from the schools for our children, and, and come budget time, what we think um, citizens will pay for. Okay, Eric? 
I was going to kind of along those lines, but also a passion. Mm -hmm. ah. then, then um, convert into a willingness to work with and see a path forward. But usually, sometimes when you're very passionate about something, you can work better and see better. Passion, and, and passion's tricky, right? I, I've worked with boards where every single board member had the word activist in their bio on this website. And, and I was talking with an activist yesterday morning at coffee, who's on a board, not yours. And uh, we were talking about how, you know, how important it is to sort of maintain focus on that passion, but yet figure out how to do it in a way that's palatable or effective, right? Like, how to, how to bring forward an issue in a constructive way. Uh, Daniel, did you have your hand up? You're just thinking. You have a thinking expression for <laughs> so the, What everybody was saying, that diversity of thought that we all bring and the willingness to be a critical thinker, uh, the, you know, the willingness to learn, but mostly the understanding of how important public education is for the future of uh, our kids right so yeah. so we bring that citizenship to the scale that every day through the doors of our schools you know we're you know not making but like giving opportunities to all the kids is the equalizer for our society the future citizens so i think that you know that's not necessarily a it could be a passion for some but it's like understanding of the bigger purpose of public education which is part of the reason we have boards right and to connect it, you know, we're not disconnected with our communities. So, yeah, let me extend thinking. just a thought from what's been said because all of you have said aspects of this, but maybe the one thing that we all need to bring to school board service is expert citizenship, yeah. right? That, that ability to listen to other ver viewpoints, to bring the passion of our perspectives and figure out how to collaborate, how to cooperate, how to relate, and, and the community connections piece, right? Like, how do we bring that sort of, and maybe it's the wrong word, I don't know, but that expert citizenship to the dais. Um, ensuring that all voices are heard and that we're behaving in a way that's not front page news. Um, really? I, okay, may I move on. So, what are we asking boards to do if they're going to govern in the best interest of all students or each and every student? What are we asking boards to do? Former board members in the audience? Or? No, they left. One or two left, one is here. No. Well, I think we're, I mean, with our committee work in that, we're working to balance it. We're working to understand whatever experience isn't our own. So in order to budget or in order to plan, I need to be sure that I'm understanding each step of the journey that all of our learners are going through. And so we need to be open and in dialogue around what that looks like. And staying in dialogue. Right, how to, how to stay in dialogue. How do we govern in a way, what, this is something, frankly, we know a little bit about from this chapter, but we need to know more about. Like, how, what does governance look like that truly is supporting improved achievement of all students and supporting closing gaps? So in the book they talk about a balanced approach to the uh -huh. governance, right? about it, it's that fire tower level where we stay in the fire tower and we look for the bigger problems and then let administrators do their thing. But also being that voice that talks to the community to tell them like what we're trying to achieve in our schools, but also the limitations. We talked about it tonight. We have limitations, we have constraints to the to the budget. And we need to communicate it to the community. So there's a lot to the word balance, and they do highlight that difference between like being totally disengaged versus micromanaging, and what is the right sort of conceptual thinking of board members for how to operate in what we might think of as informed oversight, 
Like, what does it mean to be informed and asking thoughtful questions at a governance level? Um, Ivan loves to draw those boxes, and he's, driven, he's drawn a lot of boxes since this book came out that sort of has the community in there and principles in there and you know, all the different configurations, but it's the overlapping. And I think he identified what's a key there is where does the board overlap, especially with the superintendent, right? And they talk about how there's things the superintendent can do and only she can do. There's things the board can do and only the board can do. And then where's that shared space so that it's not the extreme of micromanaging, and it's not the extreme of rubber stamping either. Like finding, um, you, you only get there through a conversation, and an ongoing conversation, because who knows what comes up tomorrow, what the issue is, and, and what did the board need to be informed about, what did the board need to be involved in, uh, what is truly just the work of the superintendent and her staff, right? It, it's an ongoing conversation, like any other kind of relationship. So as you think about what the board can do, I think it's seven. Maybe what I sent you as a note was five different broad areas that showed, in Ivan's research nine years ago in the state of Montana, so give it those boundaries, looking at a comparison between what board members said they did and student achievement as measured by a state standardized test. What were those broad areas in the middle of this chapter that they identified? And again, several of these, in fact, the first one I think was number one, highly st statistically significant, um, uh, R, R value of 0.71, so extremely significant in statistically speaking. What, what was that, that number one area that they listed? You got your book there. Okay, <laughs> Is that evaluating the superintendent? Yes, evaluating and the And holding them account holding the superintendent accountable holding for the superintendent or accountable. So so the, the problem I have with this book is that it has a lot of generalizations without specifics. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering if there's um, like kind of a follow up where I think in business school they have case studies of this is a business problem, this is what they did to try and improve it and what did and didn't work. We have more specifics as opposed to you know, just a general statement of principle. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, pointing out the thing that I would say is a problem with the book as well, right? That this was a lot of academics create, you know, sharing their perspectives, insight, and sometimes misses that, okay, exactly, what are you asking us to do? And, and the specifics in that question on the board self-assessment, you know, is the board evaluating the superintendent based on achieving goals for student achievement. You, you know, so it, it, it really did get concrete. Some would even say maybe too concrete, uh, but that's not relayed too clearly in the book, right? So, so it doesn't end up kind of giving an, an a, a, okay, you evaluate the superintendent, and if the goals aren't being achieved, then what? And you, you're dealing with a board that, you know, just doesn't, really fire people and so it's getting you're not getting into the nitty-gritty of saying okay this is what the board should be doing megan no 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 okay <laughs> please no pitchforks um but it's just it's just a reality check is that um you know we don't we don't do that here um but what no no, no just hear me out generally it's a general statement general statement just say it and uh, i know i know i know but how do you get to Not the point? The how do you get to the point of holding people that. accountable? Yeah. Is what I'm really getting at. Is right. you say, okay, you can hold them accountable, and then, especially with the board that doesn't have the expertise to say, we think this particular educational uh, maneuver that you took or this this program that you implemented didn't really work out well because we think it did blah blah blah. We're not. We're relying on the the administration mm -hmm. to give us the information because that's their lane of expertise, right? Yeah. So it's kind of how to, how to negotiate that or how to get, so it's, so it's um, substantive, I guess. 
on this topic, do the board members want to yield the floor to the superintendent, or do the board members want to keep talking? Either way, either. Oh, I don't, I'm uh, happy to have you here. To the room here. You can, have, this this, is, this is the conversational part. Up. Yeah, no, this is good. I, I just wanted to like put something in perspective that I did see in the book. Like we don't uh, the evaluation of the superintendent is not in isolation of setting our goals, in aligning our goals, and in understanding what uh, uh, where are we going as a district. So not all the data is responsible in one in one person, right? So uh, I, I think some of the time, at least in my mind, a lot of the times when organizations fail is because you're relying just in that one leader, right? You're, we're not never relying in just one leader to make all the things, all the things happen. So the evaluation of the superintendent is to continue, to me, is to make sure that if there's places where we need to improve, you know, we are in communication to put that as priorities every time that we improve, whether it is personal growth or it is for our, for our district, but we're not evaluating the superintendent in order to fire or not to fire, you know what I mean? So I just wanted to put that into perspective, at least from my point of, a very isolated point of view. This is what I believe, Megan. <laughs> like, He's on to something clear. good, though. And, yeah, and, I understand uh, where you're coming from. It's, it's, it's the accountability part. Yep. Yep. How do you enforce the accountability, or how do you pursue it? Um, and, and, you know, firing is certainly the extreme, but if you want incremental improvement, yet yeah, there's, how do you, how do you, how do you ensure accountability? Yeah, accountability and growth. Like, yeah. how, how's the conversation about growth? And I, I hopefully we get to chapter eight someday. Um, and we'll talk more in depth about when you evaluate a superintendent, you're evaluating the impact of leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's hard for a lot of us. It's not something we would typically have experience evaluating, the impact of someone's leadership on a system. Um, Megan and then Jonas? Or I was Jonas gonna say Jonas, go, and then I have a thought. All right. So speaking to the, the lack of concrete sort of suggestions and steps and mm -hmm. best practices, what I'm gonna say is gonna sound self-satisfied, but I don't think we're the target audience for this book. I will admit, Mr. Gore, I did not read chapter four as closely as I could have, but having read the previous <laughs> chapters and having read the previous book, yeah. I have to squint really hard to look at, to see some of these challenges on this board. I think this board, as currently constructed, is working in good faith, diligently with its eyes on its goals, with its eyes on supporting all of the stakeholders in the system. We are not perfect, Floor is not perfect, Megan is not perfect, none of us are perfect. The principles are not perfect, but I think that if we, there are, there are examples, there are examples of boards that do not function very well and we do not rhyme with them. These books are going to be this, this, this kind of literature and research is going to be most useful for a board that, when it reads this, is looking in a mirror. That's not this board. But the problem is we can't get a dysfunctional board to read this. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they so I think the extension of what you're saying is, how do you, what do you put in place? What practices, what policies, what mechanisms do you put in place to keep the board stable over time, and what would take this board to the next level in an iterative way? So Phil, I, I think my comment, I really appreciate that, Jonas, because I think, um, and, and anyone was at the Ed Quality meeting a few minutes ago, or a little longer than that, that is what this, this board is talking about metrics, to be able to understand how we're doing on our goals, and those are, are, I mean, we're having really good conversations about how will we know if we're, if we're um, doing well. Those are, I think, some of how, and, and that, yeah, there's, invol I mean, evaluating the superintendent's part of that, but some of that is, what's the health of the system? What does that tell the board? What does that tell the board about how to direct their resources? What does it tell the board about different ways to direct the resources because of what we are finding? And I think that I mean, I w I've seen more, uh, more helpful and, and uh, positive conversations in the few ed quality meetings that I've had here than in my past history where boards have taken years to talk about what are our indicators going to be. So I think we are, and I, I, that's the credit of this board because that work preceded me for sure. 
Um, that is how we know whether or not we are doing our work. And it, it isn't in a gotcha way. It's in a, oh, this is what we learned. And what does that mean about what we learned? And um, so I think that's part of it. I think this board is building structures to, to solidify that and to make it that more predictable. That, that's part of where the work is right now, is like, what's the, how do we do that so that as new members come on board, they, they know, oh, this is how we measure things. <laughs> I think Joshua had his hand up, speaking of new members coming on board. Did you have your hand up a minute ago? Yeah, I did. I, I was going to respond to Jonas. Um, uh, and it's really nice to hear that in a way. Um, and as the newest member of the board, at having never served on the board before, um, I think this book has been really interesting for me to, to understand the ins and outs. And I think um, when I was in one of my other jobs, we were trying to unionize faculty, and they were like, oh, well, we have a great relationship with our, uh, with our president, and our response was, well, she's not always going to be the same president. Right. And I think on a board like this, uh, on something like this that changes um, on a semi-regular basis, or sometimes it might go faster, like having this institutional knowledge mm -hmm. spread amongst us all. I hear that. Um, yeah. Yeah, in that, so we were in that question about what are some specific actions the board can take, and they identified holding the system accountable, which is partly how you evaluate the superintendent. I mean, that's one of the big levers we have as a board, is how we evaluate the superintendent. And if we do that right, it helps drive improvement throughout the system. If we make that evaluation about growth, about improvement, and we have some measurable targets, uh, they, they identified, I think there were at least three areas in the board's self-assessment that came out highly statistically significant, and two of them were, others were very related to this. One was communicating the goals for the superintendent to the community, right? So putting that on the website and in newsletters, like not having a whole separate set of goals, but these are our district goals, these are our superintendent's goals, this is what we're shooting for, and, and then communicating that out. But ultimately, uh, the board needs to use, you know, use the quantitative uh, approach as a, a piece of uh, decisions on the superintendent's contract, decisions about extension, decisions about raises, that kind of thing. Uh, when that's all tied together, that seemed to be some of the things that correlated with systems that were improving the achievement. What were, what were just some of the others in that? Go ahead, come um, on. Well, I largely agree with what Jonas said, which is that, you know, I feel like we hit a lot of these fairly well. Um, in general, I would say the one that I start with the community engagement piece, um, I feel like that keeps coming up yeah. as an area of growth um, that we can work towards. Um, so. Good. Anything else that you'd pull out of that and say, you know, here's, Here's one we're doing really well, or here's one where maybe we could identify it as an area of focus. What gets fuzzy for me is kind of um, creating conditions for success. Right? You know, exactly precisely what does that mean, and it gets kind of theoretical. What role does the board have in the overall culture and climate of the district? How does the board engage with each other and then together with the superintendent to sort of message to the community that things are stable, but yet they're also <clears throat> striving for improvement, right? Like, how, how does a board do that? Any thoughts on what actions the board takes that sort of help contribute to conditions for success? I'm just struck by that one. There's a variety of things in there. Like this board has always prioritized facilities, and I think we've done a really good job with that. But also in that category was getting involved in setting curricula. And yeah. I, I, I've never been yeah. part of a conversation about at that level. I don't think so. That, that was interesting to me. Yeah. What What is the board's legitimate role in curricular decisions? Like, yeah. That can be because in the large states legislated that things are adopted and then the school board gets more involved when it's not at the local level like it is in Vermont. 
Yeah. Any other thoughts on, on specific actions of the board that might support improved achievement? I think that we have done very well at staying out of the weeds, as Ursula often reminds us in the heat of, of discussion. Um, She's the monitor of that particular area. You know, I think that we have made, we have been very clear, and I think we can credit Steve Luck for a lot of that, right? Very clear about what we want. We want that floor raised. After that, like, what else can we, I mean, we are trying to engage with the community, right? We are trying to ensure a welcoming workspace for the staff. We are trying to make schools a welcoming place for everyone, right? And not blaming and shaming the community for things, right, that, right, that we're, that's not what we're doing. I think though, I mean, other than getting involved, like getting involved in curricula, like I don't think this, I don't feel competent to do that. That would be a terrible thing for me to be making decisions. I mean, this is what we're, we're trying to provide the leadership to the leader, uh -huh. right? And create the conditions in the community for children to thrive. No. But I, Diane? Oh, sorry, but I think that, like you said, the, circum the wave hasn't quite hit us yet as to what we do. I think we all collectively feel that we are also that buffer should outside pressures come and tell us how to, you know, how our kids should learn what we should provide. I think we are all fully committed to being that, that stop. And so, you know, we haven't had that wave yet, but I, I feel very comfortable that I know that's an action that we would take. Yeah, and I think you're on the right track because that wave is coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to look far to recognize sort of the partisan ploys that are infecting and affecting school boards, and it's pretty creepy scary. Um, I've lived in some of it, and I've tried to help boards through it. I've been recently digging into older information and reports, you know, what were boards doing during the Great Depression? What were they doing through the civil unrest of the 60s? What can we learn to, you know, try to bring forward because these are disturbing times in the work of school boards around the country and in many areas of Vermont. Uh, so I mean, you, you can see why it's like that's coming to a theater near you sort of thing, potentially, right? Uh, Ursula? I was going to say, and it's in line with what Jonas said, we've started taking these steps, right? We've started the super evaluation process. We were working on building a an evaluation process that will be annual that we will do and there will be a review cycle. And, and, and kudos to Jen. Kudos to Jen mm -hmm. for helping us do that last year. Yeah. So uh, speaking of, my back has been to all of you <laughs> for more than half an hour. Anything from your perspectives that you could contribute to, maybe it's even a perhaps, you know, it's, it's like, Here's what I'm thinking about or wondering about. How can, what can a board do to, to support improved student achievement and closing gaps in achievement? You know, I asked Steve Dellinger Pate four years ago if he would give us bad news and it, it, not just good news and when, if he would tell us when we're not doing as well as we could. That's good. And he did. <laughs> I hope you guys will too. At least anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> if it needs to be anonymous. Somehow, some way. Yeah. Yeah, what? Actually, you know, we, we had an experience from Barry recently where the administration did say to the board uh, a couple months ago, maybe, saying, you guys need to do better. You need to do better. And at least the more recent report in the, uh, the Times Argus was that there was some incremental improvement. Not, not fantastic, but incremental improvement. And it was, it was probably fresh to hear that, uh, that they need to do better. The board needs to do better. 
Any thoughts from the book? Like it's not your own thought, it's not an accusation, you're not throwing stones, but just something <laughs> positive boards can do to support improved achievement, increased community connections. Say something, thanks. <laughs> 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 but I think just, uh, you know, it's appreciated when um, you listen to building administrators, um, listen to our feedback or input or just I guess, anything. Um, I think uh, these are very challenging right now with this shortage of staff. Um, you know, I can't speak for the schools, but, you know, I have our kids here that are really behind. So there's like the reality of the day to day in the trenches, things that are just day in and day out hard. Um, I don't think some of that stuff always kind of rises to. Like that's for us, it's our job is to kind of figure that out and work as an administrative team to figure those things out. Um, but I guess just when there was that connection to like what happens in the trenches, um, it's, 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 it's challenging right now. Yeah, now it opens up. Go ahead. So, but I think also dovetailing on that, because uh, we're facilitating great things this afternoon. Um, I think the thing is about achievement to keep in mind is we have students coming off 30 months of disrupted education, and yet we're continuing to measure them against standards. You, you know, we, we cannot look at our students and say, Oh, my God, my golly, our sixth graders aren't like functioning like sixth graders all the time, except for Michaela's daughter. I'll give you theme to try to wrap up with, right? Um, back to how does the board model behavior that you want to see happen in the classroom? I, I, I've asked that with boards in Vermont that are, have, have been behaving in ways that 
they would have expected a student to be disciplined for. Right? And, and that idea of the board as not only just a steward of the public's trust in general, but in particularly a steward of civil discourse, uh, a democratizing approach to school governance, uh, an approach that's inclusive and reaching out and bringing people in as opposed to partisan debate or bickering um, or making sides or working in collusion behind the scenes as comes out in newspapers from time to time to divide board members against each other or against the superintendent or whatever. I mean, if there's something we can do, boards can do right now, it really is about modeling civic engagement, modeling civil discourse, not violating open meetings law, um, some of the things we see across the state, a lot of overuse and abuse in executive session um, for people to say things to each other that never needed to be said to start with. And so how, how does the board sort of stay above that and absolutely, when things are going well, that's the time to have those conversations, right? Because you can't have them when things are dismantling or unraveling. So hopefully this was helpful to you. The next three chapters in this book really focus a lot on board self-assessment uh, from different approaches, different authors are talking about, here's the kinds of things that Board should be self-assessing and saying, are we, are we doing well, are we struggling? What are some areas for us to focus on? And those three chapters you know, really tie together in helping the board sort of model a professional reflective practice that you want to see happen throughout the school system with the superintendent, with other staff, with teachers, and with students. Um, modeling that self-reflection, how are we doing? Um, am I doing all the things that I can do, or are there some things we, we need to work on? So, thanks for your time again. Sorry to run a couple minutes over. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. So, with that, we're going to move into our, the rest of our board meeting. I you know, want to appreciate the staff for being here with us tonight. Don't feel like you have to stay through this last part, get home, get something to eat, and, and rest. And I think you know, the board will continue to strive to be, continue to create that culture that we want to see in our buildings. And you know, we try to mirror what we learn from you. And hopefully, we will make you proud as we go through the budget process. So let's move into uh, approving new teacher resignations and leave of absence. We had some data. Oh, yeah, it's OK. OK. Thank you, Natasha, for being here. Uh, you can probably do the nomination quick first, and then you can do the stuff part. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oops. Uh, Lindy, do you want to take this? Uh, I just have my, if somebody else wants to take it, it's just, but Lindy's ready. <laughs> As says late, but read each of them. Does that make sense? Uh, read, read, each, read, each name. read each name and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of the three long term substitutes Karen Dyer at East Montpelier as a classroom teacher, Lydia Basie as a 32 nurse, um, Kate Bigham at E32 nurse for the remainder or parts of the 22 23 school year. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, second? Second. Check. No. Chris. Ursula. You're so polite. Yeah. So, Lisa, who did you get? Who did you get for second? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with that. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, you guys all got to see the substitute memo. In, uh, in, if I have a motion, then we can talk a little bit about it. Could I have a motion to approve? I move that we approve the uh, substitute rate change as proposed in the memo. Okay, thank you. No way, Lisa heard you, Chris. Oh, sorry. I move that we um, um, support and approve the um, proposed substitute um, changes. changes for salary. For substitutes uh, proposed in the memo. Second. OK. 
Okay. Now discussion so that we can hear a little bit about it and yep. maybe people have questions first. I appreciated the email we got from you, Megan, explaining and giving the area around right. us, yep. comparatives, mm -hmm. because this is such a big problem in the state right now. Um, if it helps get local people that you have control over, I prefer that. Yes. Um, I'm sure you do too. <laughs> but having people in the building that you trust and have been vetted is really important. Yeah, I think, I mean, in, you folks have been aware of our challenges trying to fill it. This is one way. Um, as is the permanent building sub, um, which is a, a a position that many districts use that brings them some stability and predictability. Whether or not any of these are the magic wand that we need to to rectify our staffing challenges, I don't know. I don't think there is a magic wand, but um, these feel like two really necessary steps, um, particularly at U32. So happy to ask uh, answer questions. I guess I'm curious about the comparatives. Like, is there a relationship across the state between substitute pay and an ability to fill those substitute positions? Like, is the Principals Association or anyone tracking that? So, I'll be honest, um, and this is through uh, the answer to the whether or not the VPA is tracking, I don't know. Um, but based on the conversations that I have with my counterparts in multiple parts of the state, um, many have increased sub pay and all are still struggling with finding subs. This is kind of what I mean by I'm not sure that this is a magic bullet. Mm -hmm. However, I don't want to not unearth this stone to see if it will work. Um, and it only makes sense to be comparable with our neighbors because that's who we are sharing resources, or not sharing resources, but competing, quite right. frankly. Yeah. So um, that's, the, that's, a hard convert, that's a hard thing, hard answer, but anecdotally, I, I, everyone is still struggling. And almost every system that I interact with regularly has at least in the past year or so up there. maybe 10 years ago, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We were one of the highest paying substitutes mm -hmm. in the area. Because I, I remember thinking, well, oh, that's more than. And so when you sent that information, it was interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, I, and that happens too. And we did not move to exceed our neighbors. I mean, this mm -hmm. has a financial impact just yes. to do this. It's an impact we think we can weather, and it's an impact we think is worth it to try to get people, but that, you know, it's it's still an impact, but it's one that we think is manageable. Yeah. Is there any impact on the um, collective bargaining agreement to have the permanent sub? Is yes. there has that been vetted? So, by uh, um, Stephen has had conversation because this is going to start at U32. Yep. He has had conversations with the association, um, and and yes, they're comfortable with it. The one thing he understands is that it's possible that when he posts that position, a current support staff might say, "Oh, yeah. that's a really interesting." Type mm -hmm. of job I want that, and then he'll have a vacancy under here if he right. For the permanent side. Correct. So that's a he understands that. Yeah. Um, so that's more just of it may become an appealing position to someone else. Berlin okay. had one in the past though, so that's interesting that that in terms of the challenge around the collective bargaining. I mean, years ago they had one. Yeah, and I don't think it's a challenge. I think it's just a an additional when, right when you create a position in a, in a thin staff, and you, mm -hmm. you rob Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. Um, that's all. Yeah. I'll also say, this is a minor, a couple of minor things, but uh, the language around duties in the teacher's agreement says that if teachers perform duties above, um, you know, I think beyond 90 minutes weekly, then they'll be reimbursed at the prorated sub rate. And the ESP agreement um, also has something about the sub rate uh, that <coughs> um, unused personal days, the unused personal day that we encourage people to not take at the end of the year um, will be paid out at the per day sub rate. So do we need, do we need to clarify here uh, that that language applies to the 
substitute subrate as opposed to the permanent subrate because those are two different numbers. I think it's, it's, it's the per, per day. day. Yeah. Per, yeah. Oh, it's a per yeah. day. Is that what it says? Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. He yeah. asked whether or not the contract references the daily sub rate or this new rate that's attached to the permanent sub, and the contract references the daily. The rate. daily rate. Okay. So the one twenty-five. Sub would be almost like a, a separate it's job. A, correct. Yeah. It's a separate job. Yeah. 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 And if it is something that proves to be viable and proves to work, then it would become a conversation that Stephen would have as part of the budget process. So it is in, it is intended to be this temporary right now to see if it if it works. I mean, could could work at the elementary schools as Absolutely. a rotating yep. to available mm -hmm. to each one, you know, yes. whoever needs it on the day. And yeah. we've actually had that conversation as well, that if it proves viable at the high school, what would be the mechanism to have the same type of support for the elementary <coughs> schools? And it would be probably some sort of shared, or maybe two mm -hmm. between, right? The, right. So to, to, be, to be determined based on how this works. We have one in the building where I work. Yep. She knows everybody. She knows all the classrooms. Um, if there was ever a day we didn't need a sub, which I'm not sure that has ever happened, <laughs> um, she's available at school for other things. I mean, there's always some need. Yep. But we all know her. And she's just part of the staff. <clears throat> yep. I've been in systems that also have used this position, um, and it's, that is that's the advantage that people describe. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much. So aye. we just voted, though, on the raise. We didn't vote well, on the I permanent. On the memo. And, and the memo. And the memo, memo it said so that. But, it, all, but the motion was. Did Chris's motion include so full steps? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. you said approval of the memo. Oh, so, oh, okay. so we are okay. so we are approving the the this, the job description and the salary. That's sure. That was what you I would. Do you want oh, to have sorry. any? That's a, so <laughs> I'm going to offer another motion that we approve the we permanent sub proposal sure. um, in the memorandum. Um, the job description the, and, and the salary and the salary for the permanent sub that will initially um, work at U32. But let Lisa put it and read it to us so that we. Is that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If everybody feels comfortable with that, I don't think yeah. we need to revote. But yeah. that, that's what yeah. is that a clarification? Okay. That's what I, that's what I understood. Okay. But yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what I told. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We can adjourn. Thank you, everybody.